true satisfaction. Someone has well said, the world has changed. And sadly to say, in some ways we are changing with it. Yeah, we've got all our computers and we've got our mobile phones and whether we like it or not, they're there and they're there to stay. And I was looking at the program last night and seeing how advanced, how advanced these things have really taken uh, the people and the, the outlook in life. What technology uh, has done to our society and how powerful the technology has really taken over. But we as the people of God, the world has changed. And sadly to say, much of the church has changed with it. But Evangelist D.M. Moody encouraged Christian joy in his preaching and in his teaching. And uh, the, he once said in uh, one of his uh, campaigns, he said these words, there are too many religious meetings which are sadder than a funeral. There are hindrance to the cause of the gospel. They breed people with faces bearing an expression as chilling as an east wind from the lake. And anyone who lives in Chicago, where D.L. Moody lived at that time, as Mr. Moody did, knows what it means by a cold east wind from off the lake at Chicago. What Mr. Moody says is true. The greatest obstacle to sinners coming to Christ in these days is the joyless attitude of many professed Christians. Psalm 16 is here to encourage you and I this morning. God's remedy, God's remedy for your need and my need just today to have true satisfaction, not only to be saved and secured and sanctified, but to be satisfied and to know that God has a plan and a purpose for each one of us. David's life was always in danger during those turbulent years when he fled from King Saul. And as many men of God, he certainly was not free to do and live as he liked. In the times of his life, when he disobeyed and fell into temptation, he had to pay the price. We are going to look at this psalm for a few moments now. However, in the light of what it meant to David, but what it should mean to you and I in, nine, in 2013 this morning. And I just want to leave three little thoughts with you this morning from this little psalm. And verses 1 to 4 tells us about the Lord's people. The Lord's people. Those who Jesus has come into their lives and changed them, transformed them, and made them new creations. And that's what the Christian is all about. A Christian is someone who has experienced the blessing in the person of God in his or her life. Praise God for the kids that have got saved. Praise God for the backsliders being restored. Praise God for the, the couple that's come to faith in Christ. And you know, friends, God is still the God of salvation. And that is why he allowed the Lord Jesus to go to the cross to pay the price of our sin and to pay the price that you can be saved this morning. To know that God wants that relationship with you and he wants to come into your life and to, to transform you. To make you that new creation this morning. And here we see that the Lord's people are those who love and long to serve the Lord in their lives from day to day. As David tried to serve and follow the Lord, it was no easy task to live close to him, especially with his position and responsibility and all that was going around him and how he could look back in, the, in his laurels and, and how God had blessed him and used him so mightily. And yet David here, he cries to God, preserve me. Preserve me, the king of all Israel. Preserve me, the king, the anointed one. No, friends, we cannot just rest in our laurels in these days. We must be vigilant 24-7 as you go to your work, as take up our responsibilities in the Monday morning and as we go through life. We cannot just let, let those uh, ropes go too slack. Must to keep tight reins in the Lord and let the Lord preserve us from day to day. Like that wee man yesterday, boy, when he let that rope go, I tell you, the people were not too happy. There was an in, a whole cloud of insecurity. You know, when we let the rope slip and just go our own ways and God's not there, 
you know, and we're pushing God out beyond the boundaries, well, then we have that life of insecurity. But when God's in it, God has promised to bless us. So in verse 1, his cry was to preserve me from all that was going on in my life. He could look and he could praise God, living in the Lord's presence, the godly man, no matter where he is, and no matter what he may have to meet, the Lord God Almighty is always with him. And all that he seeks to do and, and all of where he seeks to go. And in verse 2, Thou art my Lord, David cried. Thou art my Lord. This is not, in, is this not encouraging to us as, a, as the Lord's people this morning. That he is with us every part of the journey. You know, uh, there's a young lad and he's, he's in our church up in Macafelt and He's got a great job. And you know what it is? Everybody's looking for him because he has this responsibility to go to a house and to put on surveillance cameras. And whenever someone wants their house more secure and feel that, they, you know, that, that there's a robbers about and things are being stolen from the neighborhood, they, they ring Andrew up and say, we want to put on a, some surveillance cameras around the house. And there would Andrew would go and he would measure up the, the house and see where it's best to put the surveillance cameras. And his job would be to, to give that house more protection, to keep the robbers and the thieves away. His job is to, to put up the surveillance system. I know God has promised to give us that surveillance. He watches over us from day to day. As we walk with him and trust him from day to day, he is with us with his presence to help us and to, to take us from, from, from place to place and from, 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 from position to position and, and from area to area. He's always there with us. And David could look and say, well, as the Lord's people. And these verses 1 to 4, yes, living in the Lord's presence. And praise God for that, that we're always under his watchful eye. You know, friends, that can be a really great encouragement to each one of us. Because if we go out into life and meet the circumstances and the trials and the tribulations, no matter what you and I might have to meet, God's presence is with us. And who we have to talk to, what situations we might find ourselves in, God is always there with us. He says, I will always be with you. And is that not what, uh, uh, you know, Joshua whenever he was going to take over that great responsibility of taking the people of God over the Jordan into Canaan. He, he was there to, and he put all the excuses to God. Well, God, I can't do that because I'm not Moses and, and I can't be a leader like Moses and, and I could do the things that Moses did. But then God said to Joshua, I don't want Moses. Moses had his time. I want you to be the leader now. And the gifts that you have is the gifts that I want to use to take the people across the Jordan, take them in to conquer the land because you've got the gifts that you don't even see you have yourself. And isn't that true sometimes? That God does take us into situations. God uses us mighty at times and he uses and gives us the gifts and brings out those gifts within us that we don't even realize that we had. Whenever I was in the bread point, boy, I was happy all over up in cold rain up at five in the morning and, and selling the bread round the northwest. And I was great. But see, when God told me to go to Bible college, no, Lord, no way. Whenever I left the, the secondary school up in cold rain, that was me finished. I threw my bag at the age of 16 over the hedge and me with school was finished, definitely. I was wanting to get on with life and drive in the bread van Get out there, make money, and get on with life, and make yourself a lifestyle, and that's it. And God put his hand upon me and said, Bible college, he and I had a few nights of argument. But God knew best, because I had no peace or joy until I did what God wanted me to do. And it's not true for each one of us. As Christians, we'll never have that true peace, that true joy, until we're doing what God wants us to do and in the place where God wants us to be. Hi, keep it simple. Keep it plain. Just do what the Lord wants you to do. And this is what the secret of David's life preserve me, O oh Lord. He knew that the Lord had promised him his presence no matter what he was going to go through. Then secondly, he was living for the Lord's people. 
David had discovered in his own life and experience that it was better to find his delight in the Lord's people than to cultivate his confidence, confidence in others. David then was not only living in the Lord's presence, he was living for the Lord's people. They were his delight. This also should be the joy and a hallmark in the lives in serving God's people. Someone as well said, I think it was old Sam Best of the York Road, he said, you know, Desi, there's no people like the Lord's people. They're maybe not the easiest to get on with, but there are no people like the Lord's people. And I said, praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Yes. And there's no greater place to be in the Lord's house and serving the Lord's people, whether here in Ireland or over in China or over in Africa or in South Peru. You know, the people of God, we're the best people because we're the God squad. That's what a wee man said to me one day last year when I was pulling into the, the show and I was a wee bit late and, and I, I, I kind of thought I lost my spot and my pitch and somebody else had taken it over. And uh, oh, I said to the boy who was going in, I said, uh, I said, I think I've lost my spot. No, I said, there's always a spot for you guys because you're the God squad. There's always a spot for you guys. There's, you're the God squad. And isn't that true, friends? Yes, we are the Lord's people. And that is an exciting thing for us this morning. And not only living by in the Lord's presence and the Lord's people, but living by the Lord's precepts. David knew well about idolatry. He had experienced in his life on those occasions in which he had to separate himself from the things contrary to God's word. I know, friends, so often today, as we see our news screens and listen to our newscasts, it's so discouraging that the government stuff today, they're moving the goalposts. They're doing this and they're doing that. And it's not, it's, not, it's not glorifying to our God. And it's not glorifying to his word. But may we not lose sight of our God. May we not be starting to shift the goalposts. No, those idolatrous times in the judges were still very much alive in everyone's memory in David's little day. King Saul kept pagan men just like Doh, or the Ammonite, on his payroll. David wanted no part of that kind of thing. He wanted to glorify God and to live within the rules of God's holy word. He was living by the Lord's precepts and his practices that kept him from evil, the evil aspirations and associations with these evil men. And it will do the same for us if we don't keep within the guidelines of God's laws and, and God's word well, then we're living outside of God's boundaries and we'll suffer the consequences. You know, Arsene Wenger, you know, dear love him. Uh, I always pray for my, my son that he's, he's got a very bad football team, Arsenal. But, you know, he's always talking about this Arsenal team and he's always talking about Arsene Wenger. So this other day I was listening to Arsene Wenger as a BBC newspaper, news reporter was interviewing him about the Saturday match. And I don't know if I, 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 they actually won or lost, but anyhow, it doesn't matter because they're not a great team anyway. Amen. But anyway, he was getting interviewed anyway by the BBC reporter, and the BBC reporter said to Arsene Wenger, well, what happened to you yesterday? It doesn't matter what happened yesterday. It's what's going to happen tomorrow. He says, I told them yesterday after the match that there's two things that they can't forget, and they mustn't forget. As we look forward to the next game, is they never lose their attitude and never lose their focus. You know, friends, it's the Lord's people. There are two keys to our success in God's walk, in the walk of God, and the work of God. Never lose your attitudes, and never lose our focus. Because what we are in the Lord is that we're saved and rejoicing in God. We've got the fullness of his Holy Spirit within us. But has he got all of us? And not only have we our attitudes right, but we must keep our focus right. What God has given us to do, keep our focus on God and keep our eyes on the goal. Yes, friends, and us not only is that it, but what was happening to Nehemiah, whenever he was building the walls in chapter 8, verse 1, when the people were getting discouraged and the enemy was taunting from outside the walls, what happened to poor Nehemiah? He didn't get down in the dumps and said, I'll give this up. I'll go back and forget about these guys. They're too hard to work with. Hey, the work is too difficult. Throw in the trial. I'll go back to my Babylon. 
I'll go back and I'll just, you know, I'm the king's cupbearer and I'll just work for the king. Forget about the work of God. Forget about the people of God. What did Nehemiah say? Bring out the scroll. Let's get back to the book. Let us hear God's word and let us get to know God's purpose. I know, friends, that's what happened. Ezra came out and opened the scroll. The people were revived. And the people got on better with the work. And they went back to the walls. Not only did they build better, but they built bigger walls. And there the work of God in the walls was complete. So often, friends, let us not get discouraged. But we're the Lord's people. And he still has got his program in this world in which we live. And let us get on with the work that he's given us to do. Then the Lord's portion. What does it say in verse 4, 5, and 6? Here in verses 5 and 6 it says, The Lord is the portion of my inheritance, and all my cup I maintain as my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a godly heritage. Yes, friends, this morning, the Lord's portion. David also delights in the Lord's portion, his inheritance and cups. Thou maintainest my joy, he says. David was excluded by Saul's watchdogs from his share in the family inheritance. Each family in Israel had its territory assigned to it by the line and lot by Joshua in the original distribution of Canaan among all the other tribes. The inheritance stayed in the family. And David's share was in the farms in the fields of Bethlehem. But so long as Saul sat on the throne, there was no hope he could enjoy his inheritance. His own parents were fugitives in Moab. Never mind, says David, David, I have a better inheritance. I have the Lord. And so often when we become Christians, the old devil would put before us the, 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 the glitter and the glamour of the world and he would put us to, to the showcases of the world just to, 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 to the Lord Jesus when he took him into the wilderness and showed him the so, showcases of the world. Just bow to me. Bow to me. That's all I want you to do. Just bow to me. And the temptation will be over. Little did he know what the only temptation was going to start. So friends, we have to be, we have to be standing in the Lord this morning to know that we're standing in his laws, we're abiding by his laws, that we're living within the lines that he's given to us to live. You know, friends, these lines that God has given to you in your life and my life, first and foremost, they must be personal. I praise God for the, the day and hour I went to Peru. Boy, it wasn't the greatest step of faith because I had all the problems, but it was the best step of faith because God was in it. And I just trusted the Lord to take me in to use me. And I praise God I made that decision that night. You know, friends, it must be personal. The story is told of King George VI of England, a born-again believer who before the occasion, um, before the accession to the throne, used to visit a small brethren assembly in London, and they enjoyed the weekly Bible readings. After he became king, he had to, dis to, to dis discontinue this, this practice. But he remained a devout believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. In the course of his duties, George VI, on one occasion came to Canada, and his official visit took him to British Columbia. It was thought by the Canadian officials that King George might like to meet a native-born Indian chief. The one chosen for the honor was a well-known and influential Indian chief known as White Feather. Chief White Feather was asked to sing for the king on that afternoon. And needless to say, the officials supposed he would sing native war song. But the chief was a Christian and had something else in mind. And as the chief got up to sing, he sung these words. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or land. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hand than to be the king of a vast domain or to be held in sin's straight sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world 
of Forge today. They stung the officials, waited to see what King George VI would do. They did not have long to wait. The king went over, took chief's white feathers by the hand, and said, I'd rather have Jesus too. See, friends, it's personal. And when God comes into our lives, all the other things, they may not be so important, but Jesus must become the prime and focus and prime one in our lives if we're going to have true satisfaction and enjoy him. But it must be possessive. Verse 6 reminds us this morning, the lines have fallen onto me in pleasant places. Yeah, I have a godly heritage. David, on this occasion, was a fugitive. When he wrote those words, like ourselves, the ways of God are not always easy to know and interpret at times. Many ways are dark and distressing. Times we can doubt and fear when we enter the unknown. The words of Proverbs 3 that we read earlier on this, with the kids this morning, Proverbs 3, verses 4 and 5, underline certainty and hope for us. We are to trust our God this morning for his provision and for his providence. He knows where to draw the lines. And Warren Wearsby says in his little commentary, problems arise when people don't know where his lines are. They want to keep moving the goalposts. And one time in Peru, whenever we had a dispute in one of the wee church communities, we found that, you know, what the communities out there were doing and what the communities w w were actually involved in, that each wee farmer had his wee bit of ground and there was no hedges to separate the grounds and the divisions, but to use these wee pegs. And each family had their pegs and they, they marked their, their territory. But at night, some of the neighbors would go out and start shifting the pegs and then it would cause disputes. And sometimes this got into the church and brought havoc and discontentment. But no friends, in God's lines this morning, we have perfect joy and perfect hope. God knows what he's doing. It must be possessive. But it must be positive. When Israel went into the promised land, he gave every tribe its inheritance. Any real estate agent and other person in, in land business, yes, we can see here that all the ways to bless his people didn't go do it. God said, here are my lines. Maintain those lines. And when we want to be a blessing and to bless the Lord in our lives and be a blessing to his people, we must obey the lines that he has set out in his providence for us. Yes, friends, this, this morning, not only are we the Lord's people, not only do we know the Lord's provision for us, but we must experience the Lord's pleasure. And in verses 7 to 11, as we close this morning, David saw something of that wonderful prospect, knowing his inheritance and his God. If we as the Lord's people this morning want to know and experience God's power and providence in our lives, you know, friends, we have to obey the Lord and live within the lines that he has designated for us. David could say, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. He is a servant of the Lord. He has certainly got his problems and difficulties. He had his soul on the throne. And God was with David. And God had promised him that Saul was going to be out of the throne and David was going to take over. But until that happened, it was not easy. But David knew that his confidence was in his God. Some fine times for us, as the people of God this morning, for us as God's people, we, do not, we don't have it easy. Sometimes we get under the blanket and try to forget about our problems, brush them under the carpet. But the problems of life are real at times and they don't always easily go away. So we as the Lord's people must with the Lord's help, must face our problems with confidence and boldness, just like, just like Joshua, when God gave those lovely promises, I am with you. No matter what happens, I am with you. Be faithful, and don't be dismayed, for I, the Lord thy God, is with you 
in all that you do. For Joshua, for David, and for you and I this morning, this was no excursion of Disney World Adventure. They had to be strong and to be bold and to be standing and to overcome their fight for the, over the enemies. Psalm 16 is a wonderful psalm for each one of us this morning. To go out with confidence to know that our God is with us. And as I close, let us have these little thoughts in mind that we are the Lord's people, that we are living in the Lord's portion and we're out to experience the Lord's pleasure. But there's three things here. We have the providence of God with us. Maybe you're saying to me this morning, well, Desi, you don't work where I work. You don't live where I live. You don't have to deal with the problems I have to deal with. You don't have to meet the people I have to meet. The devil that you have behind you the more morning is the same devil I have behind me. But the same God I have within me is the same God has promised to be in you to, to help us in all that we do and where we go. We have the providence of God with us today. We do not need the ways of the world to guide us. Oh, yes, friends, I praise God for the sat navs and praise God for the mobile phones. Actually, in the new car, I was using my mobile phone. I don't have to go and rustle around and get my mobile phone now. Hi, it's hand-free kit. Praise the Lord, because the last two weeks I nearly got caught with the police. The, the last two weeks when I was going through Antrim, I outside the police station, the phone rang, and the police car was coming out, and me and the mate left on the phone. And, uh. oh, so frustrating at times. But there we are, hand-free kit. But God's sat now was always with us. Yes, friends, we do not need the ways of the world to guide us, the methods of men to control us. We have the Spirit of God within us to help us out of the divine appointed ways. People today are looking to religion and hoping to find the answers to a peace within themselves. And all is in vain. The Lord's servant this morning knows that he is guided by God and God will never leave us or forsake us. Secondly, we have the power of God with us. We have the power of God with us as Joshua did, as David did, to overcome the evil in the world around them. God was with them. And God was within them. What does David was able to say here in this psalm? I have set the Lord always before me. Do you have your devotional time in the morning before you hit that road up to Belfast? Do you have your devotional time before you hit that crowd of sinners that you're going to have to work and hassle with on the Monday morning? Do you have your devotional time before you have to meet those wee brown envelopes before they come through your letterbox and the, the postman so happily pushes them through and you're so worried about lifting them and opening them. Let's keep our, our sights on God. Let us keep our devotional life close to God. And let us know that I've set the Lord always before me. And then we have the pleasure of God with us. We know as Corrie Ten Boom, in our days of torture, when all seemed to be dark and doom in that old Nazi concentration camp there in Germany, she could say, your future can be your friend when God is at your side. God gives to us this morning, friends, just as his people, blessings that we can enjoy here on earth, as well as the internal inheritance as yet to be experienced when we get to glory. The wee boy that was waiting for his daddy coming home from a trip always waited for him to come home at the airport and then whenever the daddy would have put his bag in the bedroom to unpack it, the wee boy was always there because he knew there was a gift in that wee bag for him, that the father would have brought him home from every trip. You know, friends, there's a day coming when you and I, for our faithfulness in Christ, will know the day whenever we see him face to face that we'll enter into the joys and the abundance of eternity. But let us rejoice in the God whom we serve here on earth today, knowing that these days of mission are days of heaven upon earth to lead us and to guide us into bigger things, brighter things, and abundant things that God has for us. 
Just remember this morning, friends. Just remember sin will take you further than you want to go. It will teach you more than you want to know. It will keep you longer than you want to stay. It will cost you more than you want to pay. I found that yesterday. And how true it is that the devil wants us to harvest in the fields of sin. But don't stay too long in them. Let us know that we keep our sights on our God. And we know that we go into those fields of sin with the right purpose, with the right power, and with the right providential care that God will not only keep us, but maintain us and use us for his glory.